Test 7. In this section, you'll hear a conversation between Jill and Sue. First, you have some time to read questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Sue. Fancy meeting you here. It is Sue Johnson, isn't it? Oh, hi, Jill. Oh, it must be ages since we've seen each other. What a surprise. How are you? Yes, well, uh, I'm fine. I just got back from two years teaching in Hong Kong, actually. Oh, I thought you'd gone into computing or nursing. No, I ended up being a teacher after all. And how about you? Oh, fine. Things are going quite well, in fact. So, what have you been up to over the last three years? Working, studying, you know, the usual things. Oh, and I got married last year. Congratulations. Anyone I know? Yeah, you might remember him from our college days. Uh, do you remember Jerry? Jerry Fox? Jerry? Was he the one with the dark hair and beard? No, that was Sam. No, Jerry's got blonde hair and glasses. He's pretty tall. Well, we got married, finally. Great. And where did the wedding take place? Was it here in London? No, in the end, we decided to get married in Scotland. Jerry's parents live there, so we were married in the small village church with the mountains in the background. Fabulous. Have you got any pictures? Well, funny you should ask. I have actually got a couple here. They're a bit battered because I've been carrying them around in my bag. <laughs> oh, never mind. Let's have a look. Oh, don't you look wonderful. Who are those people behind you? Oh, that's my older sister, Clara. Oh, she looks like you. Do you think so? Everyone says that, but we can't see it. Is she married now? Yes, and she's got three children, a girl and twin boys as well. Wow, imagine having twins. Look, why don't we have dinner together and catch up on a few things? Would you like to come over one evening? Oh, that'd be lovely. What about next Friday evening? Fine, what time? Shall I come over about eight o'clock? Oh, come about half past seven. I'm usually home around 6.30, so... That'd give me plenty of time to get dinner ready. Oh, fine, and um, one last thing. Where do you live? What's the address? <laughs> oh, good thinking. Here's my card. The address is on the back. We've got a flat in an old house. We live on the third floor of a large old house. The house has been converted into flats. So when you arrive, you'll need to press the bell second from the top. Uh, the bell second from the top. Okay. There's a little intercom arrangement, so I can let you in. Right, OK, see you on Friday then. Before the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 7 to 10. Welcome, Jill. This is my husband, Jerry. Jerry, this is Jill. Hi, Jill. Nice to meet you. Uh, hi, Jerry. Well, let's come in and take a seat. Sue told me that you've just returned from Hong Kong. Uh, was it a pleasant trip? What kind of city is it? Oh, well, Hong Kong enjoys a reputation for the flourishing business. It has a population of around 6.6 .6 million. Much larger than that of Sydney, right? Sydney has a population of 4 million, I think. Yes, uh, did you enjoy staying there? Well, being a metropolis has advantages. You get the latest films and music. There's always something going on, and there's such a wide variety of different people and cultures that it's 
difficult to get bored. Of course, all this has its downside. The cost of living is very expensive, and most people cannot afford to go out very often. So, although the entertainment is available, you have to have a lot of money to enjoy it. Another problem is, like most big cities, there's a lot of crime. What about the weather? I suppose that it gets a lot of rain. Not always. In summer, it's humid, but it's cool and dry in winter. The average temperature in June and July is about ninety-one degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than here. The best seasons are spring and autumn. They are mild and agreeable. Is there anything you particularly miss of staying there? Yes, the tasty local food is to my liking, especially the seafood. Hong Kong also enjoys the fame of a paradise for shopping, but I'm not very keen on that. You know, I suppose it must be your favourite. Most shopping malls in Hong Kong have longer opening hours than those in Sydney. Some are even open the whole night during the Christmas holidays. Oh, it sounds lovely! I hope I have a chance to travel there, and I can be your tour guide. Yes, that's great. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. In this section, you'll hear an introduction about the process of producing stamps. First, you have some time to read questions twelve to twenty-one. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions twelve to twenty-one. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Tell Me More, the program where you ask the questions and we provide the answers. And we've had a wide variety of questions from you this week. And the subject we've picked for you this week, in response to your many letters, is the production of postage stamps. And as usual, we've been doing our homework on the subject. So, who designs the postage stamps that we stick on our letters? Well, in Australia, the design of postage is in the hands of Australia Post. In Britain, it's the Royal Mail that looks after stamps, and it seems that both countries have a similar approach to the production process. We discovered, to our surprise, that it can take up to two years to produce a new postage stamp. Why is that? I hear you ask. Surprisingly, it can't be all that difficult to design a stamp. In fact, it isn't. But it seems it's a lengthy business. Firstly, they have to choose the subjects, and this is done with the help of market research. Members of the general public, including families, are surveyed to find out what sorts of things they would like to see on their stamps. They are given a list of possible topics and asked to rank them. A list is then presented to the advisory committee, which meets about once a month. The committee is made up of outside designers, graphic artists, and stamp collectors. If the committee likes the list, it sends it up to the board of directors, which makes the final decision. Then they commission an artist. In Australia, artists are paid one thousand five hundred dollars for a stamp design and a further eight hundred dollars if the committee actually decides to use the design. So there's a possibility that a stamp might be designed, but still never actually go into circulation. So what kind of topics are acceptable? Well, the most important thing is that they must be of national interest, and because a stamp needs to represent the country in some way, characters from books are popular, 
or you often find national animals and birds. So, of course, the kangaroo is a favourite in Australia. With the notable exception of members of the British royal family stamps, no living people ever appear on Australian or British stamps. Every year, the Royal Mail in Britain receives about two thousand ideas for stamps, but very few of them are ever used. One favourite topic is kings and queens. For instance, King Henry the Eighth, famous for his six wives, has recently appeared on a British stamp together with a stamp featuring each of his wives. But despite the extensive research which is done before a stamp is produced, it seems it's hard to please everybody. And apparently, all sorts of people write to the post office to say that they loved or hated a particular series. The stamp to cause the most concern ever in Australia was a picture of Father Christmas surfing at the beach. And when you consider that the practical function of a stamp is only as a receipt for postage, I think perhaps the importance accorded to stamps has got out of all proportion. Well, that's all for today. If there's a subject you want us to tell you more about, drop us a line at. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section three. In this section, you'll hear a conversation between the tutor and two students about the presentation. First, you have some time to read questions twenty-two to thirty-two. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions twenty-two to thirty-two. Good morning, everyone. Well, I think we can start straight away by getting Rose and Mike to do their presentation. Would you like to start, Rose? Yes. Well, um, we've done a survey on local entertainment. Basically, we try to find out how students feel about the entertainment in the town and how much they use it. Yes, so we've called our project "Out and About." Yes, that's a good title, "Out and About." We wanted to find out how well students use the entertainment facilities in town, whether they go to see the latest plays, films, that kind of thing. Now we have our own facilities on campus, of course. Yes, we deliberately omitted those, as we really wanted to examine outside entertainment in the town. Actually. There were a lot of areas to choose from, but in the end, we limited ourselves to looking at three general categories: cinema, theatre, and music. Right. Okay. Well, first of all, cinema. In the town, there are three main places where you can see films. There's the new multi-screen complex cinema, the old park cinema, and the late night Odeon. So, if you look at this chart. In terms of audience size, the multi-screen complex accounts for seventy-five percent of all cinema seats. The park cinema accounts for twenty percent of seats, and the late-night Odeon has just five percent of seats. As you probably know, the complex and the park show all the latest films, while the late-night Odeon cinema tends to show cult films. So, when we interviewed the students, we thought the complex would be the most popular choice. But surprisingly, it was the late night Odeon. Yeah, and most students said that if they wanted to see a new film, they waited for it to show at the old park because the complex is more expensive and further out of town, so you have to pay more to get there as well. Yes, and that adds to the cost, of course, and detracts the popularity, evidently. 
Well, next we looked at theatres. The results here were interesting because, as you know, there's a theatre on campus which is popular, but there's also the stage theatre in town, which is very old and architecturally beautiful, and there's the large modern theatre, the Ashtop, has recently been built. So you just looked at the two theatres in town? Yes. What was interesting is that there are periods during the year when students seem to go to the theatre and periods when they go to the cinema, and we really think that's to do with budget. If you look at this graph, you can see that there's a peak around November and December when they go to the theatre more, and then a period in April and May when neither is particularly popular, and the theatre viewing seems to fall off virtually, while the cinema becomes quite popular in June and July. Hmm, I think you're probably right about your conclusions. Well, lastly we looked at music, and this time we were really investigating the sort of small music clubs that offer things like folk or specialise in local bands. So not musicals as such. And that's right. We looked at three small music venues, and we examined the quality of the entertainment and venue, and gave a ranking for these. A cross, meaning that the quality was poor, a tick, meaning it was okay, and two ticks for excellent. First of all, the Blues Club, which obviously specialises in blues music. This was a pretty small place, and the seating was minimal, so we didn't give that a very good rating. No, we don't recommend that one, really. Then the Sunrise, which plays a lot of South American music, was a big place, very lively, good performers. So two ticks for that one. The Pier Hotel is a folk venue, a good place for local and up-and-coming folk artists to play. Not the best of venues, as it's in a basement and a bit dark, but the quality of the entertainment was reasonable, and the lighting was very warm, so we felt it deserved an average rating. Finally, there's the Bald Rock Cafe, which features big rock bands and is pretty popular with students, and we enjoyed ourselves there as well, so total marks for that one. And then did you get any information from the students as to which of the clubs they preferred? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. In this section, you'll hear a lecture on amber. First, you have some time to read questions 33 to 42. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 33 to 42. Today in our series of lectures on nature history, we're going to be looking at amber. Do you know amber? What is it? How is it formed? What are the uses of amber? Firstly, what is amber? Amber is fossilised resin from ancient forests. Amber is not produced from tree sap but rather from plant resin. This aromatic resin can drip from trees, trapping debris such as seeds, leaves, feathers and insects. The resin becomes buried and fossilised through progressive natural changes. Therefore, amber is formed as a result of the fossilization of resin that takes millions of years. Although a specific time interval has not been established for this process, the majority of amber is found approximately 30 to 90 million years ago. You may ask why resin is produced. Although there are contrasting views as to why resin is produced, 
It is a plant's protection mechanism. The resin may be produced to protect the tree from disease and injury caused by insects and fungi. Resin may be produced to heal a wound, such as a broken branch, and resins have odors or tastes that both attract and repel insects. Resin may also be produced as a plant's method to dispose excess acetate. We know that amber survives millions of years, but what type of depositional environment preserved amber? One depositional environment for amber is marginal marine. Amber's specific gravity is slightly over one, and it floats in salt water. Therefore, amber becomes concentrated in marine deposits, moved some distance from the original site. Trees and resin may be transported and deposited in quiet water sediments. Wood and resin are buried under the sediment, and while the resin becomes amber, the wood becomes coal. Wet sediments of clay and sand preserve the resin well because they are devoid of oxygen. So, as a precious product of nature, what are the uses of amber? In ancient times, amber was used for medicine. Honey was mixed with powdered amber and prescribed for many chronics like asthma, gout, and the Black Plague. It was also used as precious decoration. The amber jewelry was thought to have the magic power against evil and dark forces. Sailors burned amber on ships to drive away sea monsters and the dangers of the deep. Amber has retained its beauty for millions of years, but if not preserved well, it may lose its charm. The softness and brittleness is likely to be attacked by chemicals and requires some special care in handling and storing. So do not put your amber jewelry on before hairspray and perfume is applied, because it will likely create a whitish coating on the amber that may be permanent. If you want to string the amber beads on silk or linen thread, remember to string them with knots between each bead to prevent mutual rubbing and chipping. Amber jewelry should not be stored where it can rub against metal or other jewelry, and storage in a soft cloth is best. Never put amber jewelry in a steam cleaner, which would shatter the gem. Never let amber come in contact with soaps or commercial jewelry cleaning solutions, which can dull the finish. Keep amber away from common kitchen substances such as salad oil, butter, and excessive heat of ovens and burners. Dust and sweat can be removed with clean, cool water and a soft cloth. Never use hot water. The amber can be dried and rubbed with clear olive oil, then rubbed with a soft cloth to remove excess oil and restore the polish. The last thing I'd like to mention is the storing of amber. Amber should not be placed near heating ducts or in direct sunshine, and avoid exposure to sudden changes of temperature. Well, that's all for amber today. Hope you enjoy this precious product of nature and have the luck to own one. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test.